Hello again, I am Blunty and it's time to actually build Project Devil's Crevice. Now I'm going to be recording this uh, in, with three different cameras actually. I've got my little um, Sony RX100, the Mark II. Well, hopefully I'll get hands on with the Mark IV sometime soon if you uh, are one of the type of people who watch me for my camera stuff. I've been promised one. I'm told I should get to play with them. Anyway, the Mark II for, for close-ups and point of view kind of stuff going on there. I've got you know, the main camera over there. I've got my little GoPro up on a magic arm here doing a time lapse, which should be kind of interesting, hopefully. And uh, I've got my little Razer uh, Siren Pro mic, which uh, Razer have just sent me to test out. Uh, I really like the original one. So the Pro one is practically the same, but with the extra output on it. But we'll get to that in a separate video. Just wanted to tell you how I'm recording this because some people get curious about that. Oh, that camera right there, that's my old, uh, my old Canon 60D little workhorse. And the reason I'm using that is because I can use hacked firmware to get it to do longer recordings. Whereas most other cameras I've got around here will cut off at about half an hour or so or less um, for various reasons. But with the hacked firmware, I can just let it keep restarting the recording automatically, which makes my life a little bit easier, so I don't have to get up every 20 minutes to half an hour to restart the camera, or if it stops and I don't notice. Anyway, rambling aside, you've seen parts one through four of the uh, the pre-build process where I explained what parts I've got and why I've got them or why I chose them. Next stage is to start building the PC itself and getting it booting up. You'd think... To the uninitiated, you think, well, it's just a matter of start screwing things into the case. Wrong, incorrect. The first stage in building a PC, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do this at a sort of new I'm gonna do explanations as I go as a sort of a newbie level, because a lot of you have expressed interest in watching me build this, that you've never built your own PC before, or you're interested in building your own thing. So I'm not gonna assume a high level of technical knowledge. I will assume a basic knowledge of what parts are and what they do. So I won't tell you why a motherboard is necessary, for example, but yeah, just I'm just trying to give you an idea of my approach to this build. I'm not even sure how I'm going to edit it all together. Maybe one big long cut, or maybe I'll punch it up to just the interesting stuff. I haven't decided yet. You guys are still sort of voting on the on the video where I asked you what style of video you want from me on this. Actually, um, just to the you know, so to break the fourth wall. But that's the magic of when I put videos up versus when I record them versus when they get published. Anyway, so we're going to put the case away for the moment, nice and carefully. Oh, I should have taken some painkillers from my dad back before I did that. I mean, it's not particularly heavy, it's just that twisting motion is bad on my back. So, the first step is not sticking it all in the case and turning it on and hoping for the best. The proper, the, the best practice, breast, breast, the breast practices, the best practice maneuver for setting up a new PC is actually build it on a bench top first. And traditionally, you either build it on, on a literal bench top with a proper anti-static mat and everything. If you don't have that, I've just got like a mouse mat or desk, desk a large desk size mouse mat thing, which I got for free at the last EBX or something from World of Warships. Never played the game, but it's a really nice mouse mat. I use it on my desk all the time. You've probably seen it in other videos. But anyway, you build it on top of the motherboard box, basically. That's the way to do it. The, uh, the traditional ghetto bench top build before you stick it on the case. That way you make sure everything works and you haven't got any issues with you know, missing cables or, or broken components and then you'd have to pull it all out of the case again and it saves you time and effort if there is an issue basically. And what I didn't show you in the, in the video about the motherboard was the, the other stuff you get with it here. Uh, it's not all that interesting. I will grab the other camera to show you here though, just for the interested out there. Uh, there's one kind of essential component that I did forget to show you. Let's get this recording. Come on, record for me. There we go. And that is the uh, the motherboard I/O backplate, which uh, all PC cases these days come with a just a, a hole in the back, basically, for the backplate to snap into. Because motherboards used to have relatively standard layouts, but these days they've all got different kinds of arrangement supports and number supports, so they all come with their own I/O shield, basically I/O plate. You snap into the back of the case, and then all the connections of the motherboard poke through it without leaving any unnecessary gaps. For, for dust and, and I don't know, cockroaches to get in and everything. Uh, there's these little things here which are really handy. We'll get to those as we wire up the board, but basically they're a nice, easy way to um, wire up the front port panels and the switches and everything without getting too fiddly. You basically plug all your cables into that first and then plug this into the motherboard instead of plugging each, all these little fiddly wires into the motherboard. But again, I'll tell you all about that as we get there. It'll make more sense showing you instead of telling you. Um, here's a, a Molex uh, power adapter that goes out to a... Uh, a uh, little fan head of the looks of things. I don't know. I don't think I'm going to be needing that. Uh, SATA cables. Yep, SATA, SATA, SATA. We're going to need two of those right off the bat. So we can put that one back. We can put that one back. We're going to keep those out. 
we don't need the power adapter so we'll keep the SATA cables out because we're going to need those at one point actually I'll put them back in the box because we're not going to need them for the test build um, the test build is basically going to be dry, um, without the hard drives because we just need to make sure it boots up basically so we'll turn that camera back off uh, but we will need actually we won't even need those straight away we'll put those back in the box and that back in the box um, aside from that there's just manuals in there there's uh, the uh, NVIDIA SLI connector if you're going for dual video cards they give you one of those they don't give you one of the AMD ones for one reason or another maybe the AMD ones come with their own uh, driver CD manual quick setup guide all that kind of stuff uh, and the manual is around here somewhere I think it might be in my bedroom still because I was reading it last night at this point I will attach myself to my anti-static wrist strap uh, not incredibly vital. There are other ways to ground yourself, like plugging in the power supply and touching the metal case. That'll ground you, get rid of all the static electricity in your body. Even if you don't feel static electricity shots when you get, you know, zap, uh, you're still carrying static electricity a lot of the time. And that low level static electricity, you can't even tell, can severely damage electronic equipment. So, oops, let's actually get myself connected properly, shall we? That works. Got to connect it to something that's grounded. Um, but yeah, it just it saves saves you having to remember to touch the case every time you move around or everything, and it's that they're cheap and easy and and you know for for the, the twelve dollars that this cost me, it could potentially save me hundreds of dollars in blowing up my motherboard or something like that. I mean, it's rare. Lots of people build without that static rich stress, but like I said, they're cheap, and why wouldn't you use one when they're cheap and they could save you hundreds of dollars? It's you know, it's it's like backing up a hard drive. Nobody ever does it until they lose a hard drive, then they become obsessive about backing up. So it's the same way with anti-static wrist straps. Once you've destroyed a few components accidentally by uh, presumably static, you can never quite be sure how it was damaged, but it's the nature of the beast. I'd rather be safer than sorry. It's not exactly an inconvenience. They're very lightweight. They don't restrict your movement. They're all in spring-loaded little lightweight cables and everything. So we've already looked at my board. I'm going to turn it around here so it's facing me the right way around, or an appropriate way around. Now, first thing to do is stick in either CPU or the RAM. I might go the RAM first. Actually, no, I won't. I'll do the CPU first. There's no right way to do it. It's just stick the components on until it's ready to boot up, basically. So let's go CPU first. So with the uh, with the CPU, uh, I'll get uh, I'll get my little camera out again and show you this. We've got a. I don't know if I can do this one hand as I film it, but I'll try. I'll try just for you guys. So CPU socket. Uh, these are nice and easy to use. Eleven fifty A ones. You basically push down on this lever, pop it out to the side, and pull up and it will lift the uh, the cover up. There's a little plastic cover on there too, but you don't need to worry about pulling that off. That'll automatically pop off for you. That's to protect all these little pins down here. It's a, This type of socket has the pins that make contact on the motherboard, while the back of the CPU has little pads. So that's, uh, you know, it makes working with the CPUs a bit easier and shipping them a bit easier, but these are the delicate bits. That's why that has that plastic cover on it. Keep that, don't throw that away when you're done, because if your motherboard ever has to go back to the manufacturer for warranty reasons or whatever, you will need to send it back with this so the pins don't get trashed in shipping. Um, and if they get trashed in shipping, they're probably not gonna help you out with a warranty. <laughs> but yeah, the CPU has a little golden uh, triangle. You can just see the golden triangle up the one of the corners. And there is a corresponding triangle on this socket there, which I don't know whether you can see it properly on there. But yeah, there is, a correct way around to put the CPU in basically if you're unfamiliar. So we've got to carefully pop open the little plastic package here making sure that we don't um, send the CPU flying across the room or something dramatic like that which would probably survive okay-ish I just don't want it to happen. So we won't touch the the top of the CPU here uh, it's very tempting because it's all shiny and stuff but the instant you get finger grease on there you start reducing its the effectiveness of the cooling because finger grease is, is it will create air gaps and, and interfere with the cooling and the thermal compound so never ever touch the top of it and certainly don't touch uh, the pin uh, the pads underneath because even minus stray static electricity could cause severe damage to this one of the most expensive parts in your computer hold it by the edges top and bottom of the edges so uh, you know be nice and careful with it you can just drop it into place no force required you don't have to push it down you just drop it into place and it will only fit in one way because it's got those little notches on the side don't force anything if it's not sitting flush you're not doing it right and that little golden triangle for your clue check your motherboard manual for which way around it needs to go all of that kind of stuff but uh, yeah anyway so actually we'll get the camera out again and now we'll do the the closing of this thing so we can see the little plastic uh, duvalaki which is the appropriate technical name for it by the way this is the CPU duvalaki so 
you pull that down as you can see the two little there's two little sort of teethy catchy things here will go underneath this this kind of screw looking thing technical terms all over the place here told you I was going to keep it simple uh, and then we just grab the lever basically and we reverse the process uh, hard to do this one hand because I can't hold the motherboard steady but there will there will be a little bit of force required you can see that the arm there flexing that's perfectly normal it's supposed to be under force and pop it back under there and as you can see that little uh, cover plate there just pops straight off no rows at all so we're going to keep that somewhere safe I'll put it over there for now so that is the CPU successfully installed nice and secure firm attachment it's not going anywhere that's all nailed down now next uh, we could do the CPU cooler next but it might be easier to do the RAM because uh, uh, the CPU cooler might you know come kind of close to the RAM slots and I forgot to double check which slots I need to use oh no it's written on the motherboard there DIM 1, DIM 2, DIM 3, okay Oh, it's, yeah, they've got, okay, I'll show you this too. In uh, in modern motherboards, in uh, dual channel RAM, if you're putting two slots in at the same time, you should put them in certain slots so they work together properly. Because uh, basically the system kind of treats the sticks as one, as two sticks as one stick to increase the speed and yeah, all that kind of stuff. But as you can see there, the little markings, hopefully it's focused enough. It's hard to do this one-handed and from this position. But, uh, I don't know. Scroll back out. You'll get the point. But yeah, on this particular motherboard, it's printed there, DIM 1, DIM 2, DIM 3, DIM 4, in the order they appear on the board, and it tells you first use DIM 2 and DIM 4. So a little cheat sheet right there. If that is not on your particular motherboard, then obviously check your manual, because it will be in there, because it is important. So let's pop out my RAM here. Again, sensitive component is RAM. Make sure you are grounded. You've, you've grounded yourself on your power supply, plugged in power supply, not one like that, some plugged it, or anti-static wrist strap, best case, you know, best practice. Uh, and RAM is easy to install, basically. It only fits in one row around. It is key. There's a little notch in the row of pins down here. It doesn't fit in the wrong way. And all you have to do is uh, undo the little clamps on uh, one side or both sides of the RAM socket. This one has only uh, one side. Sometimes they have clips on both sides, sometimes clips on one side, this one has one sided clips. So in DIM 2 first, so we just basically guide it through a little couple of slots there on the side, little channels, and give it a press down until it sort of clips into place. Easy. And uh, installation of RAM, by the way, in case you're curious, has not changed remotely since back in my day, you know, 10 years ago, whatever, the last time I actually built a system from scratch. Um, you know the, the RAM itself has changed. The technology has changed, and I think the you know the little cutout slot is in a different place these days and everything. But installation procedure is identical as it always was, and it surprised me about a lot of things about current motherboards. A lot of stuff is just legacy from just decades ago, like the ATX power supply connector. I mean that's huge. There are so many better ways, better connections that could be used these days to make it smaller and tidier and cleaner and but they're still using these these ridiculously large legacy connections. Actually, what's the, what's the password name? Yeah. Oh, I've come free of my anti stack again. I'll reattach that in a sec. But, you know, all these huge connectors, they don't need to be that big. They're just, that's just a legacy of, of how computers used to be. Um, but for competitability's sake, uh, they're, they're, they're sort of tied to them. They can't really change it. Otherwise, everyone else has to change everything else they use as well. Anyway, that's the memory done. Oh, it looks like we have a little... HyperX sticker here as well. We might save that for the case. Maybe we'll put on, maybe we won't. I'm probably going to put that little MSI badge. You saw it in the um, part part two, I think the motherboard section was. A cool little case badge one thing. So, next up is the CPU cooler. Do not start up the machine without a cooler attached, even if it is just for a power on self-test, self because these things can heat up rather dramatically and quickly, and it's kind of easy to burn out your CPU if you're not you know a little bit careful about it so i am using the stock cooler to start with which uh is apparently pretty good i mean back in the day the stock coolers used to be kind of terrible noisy rattly horrible things and weren't very good at cooling but apparently the intel stock coolers these days are fairly decent those gray pads on the back there by the way it's pre-applied thermal compound that is not a solid uh, piece of material that is that is a goo basically it's printed into place and that's why it was that's why it was important to keep it covered up with this thing so nothing spread you know mushed the goo into the wrong place but um, yeah, as soon as that makes contact with the CPU that'll start spreading out and thermal compound is to facilitate the transfer of heat 
uh, between this copper plate here and the silver plate on the CPU. Now, thermal compound doesn't, you, you don't need very much if you're applying your own. Of course, everyone will tell you this in every system build, you don't need much. It's not there to be a sandwich. It's there to just fill in the tiny micro gaps and scratches and air gaps and things like that. So you need very, very little of it. So if you're applying your own, you don't get one that comes pre-applied, be very, very mindful of that. So basically the procedure here is we basically just push this into place. It's got these little pin uh, plastic tabby things. Uh, installation is basically you put it over the CPU and you push these until they pop through the receptacles uh, on the motherboard and lock in on the other side. And removal is a similar process. But yeah, that's the little fan and heat sink. They look very much like the old stock coolers do, but apparently they're much better these days. And quieter as well, which is kind of important. So I'm going to put the uh, secondary camera down for this one because I am going to need both hands to do this properly. So let's orient ourselves in a way where we can get this cable around to the CPU um, fan connector on the motherboard nice and easily. Uh, actually, we might do that way, this way. Now, where is the CPU fan header anyway? It's so around there. Now, you, it doesn't really matter which way around this goes, as long as you're, um, you can reach your fan header on your CPU thing without mm, having the uh, cord interrupt with the, the fan blades, basically. So let's position him here, get it nice and square, sit him down evenly. So we get a nice even spread of that thermal paste. And push, push, push. I should have done opposite corners. Best practice is to do opposite corners to get even pressure down. I didn't do that. We are all locked into place, it's good. Now we connect the CPU fan up to the CPU fan header on the motherboard. And again, uh, you can't really mess this up. It only plugs in correctly one way around. So just little fiddly pins. You've got to be a bit careful, those fins are kind of delicate, not too delicate, but kind of delicate. All right, so let's just tidy up this cable run a little bit so we don't uh, interfere with the fan. Might tuck those under that heat sink there. That won't do any harm at all. Sorry, you can't quite see what I'm doing, but I need two hands to do this so we can't have the other camera, but just a little bit of basic cable tidying, getting stuff out of the way of the spinning fan blades. So let's, let's have a quick look at what I did there. Okay, so whoop, focus, there we go, CPU cooler, and we've got the fan running down underneath the uh, little power, uh, sorry, the, the heat sink here, uh, into the fan header on the motherboard. So that's that, installed, easy peasy. Next up, next up we should uh, start connecting the power actually, so I need, uh, I need a drink, it's talking constantly, I mean, not best practice, drinking energy sweet and, and sugary energy drinks next to the exposed motherboard and CPU and everything. Do as I say, not as I do. Mm. But I do need my monster import use. All right, there it is. All right, so we will plug in the power supply before we start connecting it to the motherboard just so it itself is earthed as well just to uh, prevent any potential stray current going where it shouldn't go. We will leave it turned off, there's a switch on the back, leave it turned off but plug it in just for a little paranoia's sake basically. Excuse me, I just I gotta, gotta go down. Okay. Wine like an old man bending over. Okay, so it's just. Is that good? I'll get the Sony out of the way here. Stay. All right, now here's where things get a little bit messy because I am dealing with a power supply that doesn't have modular cables, so. We have to uh, deal with a bit of clutter here. In the case, the case I chose, again, I explained this in the in the video I made about my case choice, there is superb cable management, so all this tangle of cables isn't going to be a, a big issue. This is probably the easiest way to go about it. So, main power turn on. Now there is a, a 20 pin socket here and a sort of four pin socket goes with it. Some other boards need that, some don't. If yours doesn't, obviously just don't connect it, let it hang. That's fine. There we 
go. And again, it's keyed, so you can't really screw it up. There is, there is no way to plug this thing in around the wrong way unless you're really, really quite determined to jam it in there the wrong way around. Um, which I've just done there, actually. Come on. No, no, I was right the first time. It's just a little bit stubborn. Okay, maybe... Maybe the full pin wants to go in first. Okay. So there's a couple of little teeth on this thing that you have to really plug them in at the same time or plug the full pin in first, apparently. It's the first time I've had to deal with one of these. And for some reason, this power supply was on. Because the power button lit up there. I don't know why that happened. It's still lit up. Okay, so apparently the power button lights up no matter if the power supply is in off or on position. Interesting! But nothing else seems to be powered up, so I think we're okay. Did not know that. Uh, we're getting terribly close. CPU power next. Where is it? That's uh, my ADs, that's my things. Dee -dee 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 -dee. Ah. Oh. Hmm. Where the hell is it? It's one of these. Is it you or is it you? There you are. There you are. I found you. I found you. Just let me untangle you here. Um, CPU. The the power. Uh, the uh, motherboard CCs have a completely separate power uh, power connection for the CPU, which I can't even remember whether it was. The last system I built, whether that was a thing on it, it was just coming in. I do remember it was a thing. I just don't remember whether the last system I built had this thing. So again, it's a one-way plug. It's all keyed with different shaped connectors. You'd have to be incredibly determined to screw this up. Plug it in. Good. So, quick sanity check here. Main power. We are connected to the power. The power light seems to have gone off. I don't know why that came on in the first place. It shouldn't have. Maybe there was some little residual power sitting in the 5-volt in the rail there. Uh, memory is installed correctly in the appropriate slots. CPU is installed the right way around with the heatsink connected and all locked down properly. The fan for the heatsink is connected to the CPU fan header on the board. We are, I think, pretty close to be able to turn this thing on, finding out if it uh, boots. Now, the lovely thing about this MSI board is it has power switch on the motherboard. Not all of them do. If your motherboard does not, have a built-in power switch to do the bench test. There is a way to turn it on. You basically short out, uh, uh, I can't even find them here. There are pins on the board where you're, where the, the plug for the front case buttons and stuff usually goes. If you short out two of those, uh, it'll basically boot. It's basically like, you know, using a screwdriver as a switch basically. Uh, and there are instructions you can find online to find that. I mean, if you need to know how to do that, it's easy to find out how to do that, but just don't go poking blind. If you don't know how to do it, look it up first, because if you just start shorting out random jumpers on your motherboard, you might end up in a bit of trouble. Mm. I'm just spinning my wheels here for a second, because it has been it has been a day since I put a system together. I just want to double check that I haven't forgotten anything really, really vital. Let's have a look at these power connectors. Those are the uh, SATA. That's my Molex, and those are. The, uh, the graphics card ones, with none of which I've got plugged in at the moment. So yeah, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I'm safe to try the power on self test and see if all these components actually work. I do have my monitor down here, which is a really sort of super dirt basic Acer monitor. You can get it on the camera there. That'll do. I've got to be able to see it too. Um, like $150 worth of, of very very basic monitor. I just I needed something with a, I needed a small screen with a HDMI on it uh, a little while back, so I bought one of these. I will be adding a proper serious gaming monitor to my to to the build at some point but that's an investment i can do without the moment because i can use this or i can use the tv i mean sure it's not ideal for super hardcore gaming and the refresh rates and all that sort of stuff but it gets the job done so straight into hdmi there we should be powered on we are it is connected back there good 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 now if i have done everything correctly uh, in this and how long it's, make, it's taken us about uh, 25 minutes to get to the stage just in case uh, I did wind up editing this video and you're wondering how long it took to just get the basic thing put together you can do this in like 10 minutes if you're not waffling to camera 
uh, just so you know. But oh, no, we gotta turn on the power supply. There's the actually. I'll, where's my little? Where to, what did I do with the Sony? There it is. We'll get this. We'll get the close up of this historic moment. Do do. If the camera's gonna focus for me, come on, little Sony. You can do it. There you go, buddy. All right, so the little power so button there. There's also a reset button and an overclock button. We covered these in the in episode number two where we looked at the motherboard, so I don't really need to go over those again. But this is a, this is a brilliant thing for benchtop testing. I love this. This is this makes life so much easier. And and thank you MSI for thinking of that. I mean, it's not going to get a hell of a lot of use once it's in the case, but you know, they went through the trouble of not only putting it on there but making it all lit up and everything. So, all right, everything seems to be lit up here. That fan is going, the CPU fan is going. Oh, listen to it go too. And CPU or memory change, please enter setup to configure system. Press F1 to run setup, press F2 to load default values and continue. Uh, I have a keyboard around here somewhere. We might as well go into the BIOS while I've got everything set up here. Do, 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 do. Keyboard, I've got a mouse too, because this is a, uh, this does support the a BIOS that has mouse input as well, UE5 BIOS, which wasn't a thing back in my day, by the way. All BIOSes were very, uh, it was all completely text-based and you had to key around in it and it was just awkward and terrible to use and, my God, the power supply is just so quiet. You can barely hear it hum, even, even right next to my head. Brilliant. That's good news. Even the CPU cooler is quite quiet after the initial setup. I mean, it's still an idle now, but you know, that's, that's promising. Uh, it won't get it too annoying of an issue build. And of course, I'm plugging in a USB, so I did it around the wrong way first time. And there we go, second time's the charm. Won't worry about the mouse just yet. Okay. Delete, 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 delete. There we go. BIOS. <laughs> so that is proof of concept that I have, in fact, done this correctly. And that the system, uh, these components, work and I haven't accidentally damaged them and there's no DOA stuff at least you know at a basic level we still have to see um, um, this is this is one of the superposition USB keys uh, plugs right here I tried it four times then and each time it was wrong so there we go I've got the mouse on screen I don't know how well you can see that there we can you can just see me flipping around through things there but uh, yeah brilliant we are up and running it is detecting the CPU correctly um, it's running at 3.5 gigahertz current CPU frequency 3.5 and it's uh, detecting the RAM frequency correctly it's detecting the RAM size correctly the boot drive the boot disk priority I may have to fiddle with that uh, so I can boot off the um, boot off the USB drive do, 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 do. You bar disk USB hard disk, we'll move that around there. Just doing this right now because I am going to boot the system off a USB to uh, install Windows, basically. Well, not boot, but actually, I don't know if I'm not booting it. Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I have a boot key, a USB boot key made ready to install Windows when I get the hard drives and everything attached. But that will do us for part one, I think. That's, um, you know, that's about probably half an hour's worth of video after I edit out a couple of the derpy bits where I had to get up and get a keyboard and everything. <laughs> But that is part one. The, the benchtop test has benchtop test test has been successful. I am going to take a little break now and celebrate and do a little dance, and then we will start on the next part, which will be starting to put this stuff into the case, uh, getting some basic cable management going, getting the hard drives installed, and doing all that kind of stuff. But thank you for joining me for um, part one of the. Well, it's not really part one of the build. This would be like part five, considering the other pre-build videos, I guess. Well, whatever. The initial part of putting the thing together, we'll call it. Although it's an awkward name to put in a video title. <laughs> um, I should reattach my static strap before I start touching things again. But I am Monty. I will catch you next time. Thank you for joining me. Hope this has been moderately interesting to you. And I hope this is the type of video you're looking forward to seeing from me. Didn't really come in with a plan. Just started doing stuff and talking. Which usually works out alright for me. Because, I don't know. Sometimes it doesn't, I guess. See you in the next part anyway.